All right. Can you guys hear me if I have the microphone like this? Yes. Okay. It's relatively comfortable. All right. So uh, always start with a joke. And uh, if you can't read it from the back, it says, people who know what they're talking about don't need PowerPoint. That unfortunately does not apply to me. Uh, so I have, um, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, it started uh, two Kansas Fests ago, uh, my obsession with modifying karateka. Uh, my name is Charles Mangan, and I pronounce karateka as karateka. Uh, the, um, the, the binary is, uh, is pretty well understood because it's been cracked. Um, the, the way it loads from disk and all that. Um, but there's a couple of things about it that I've always loved and I, I wanted to kind of find, uh, find new and interesting things to do with uh, Karateka. So a couple of years ago, I uh, f figured out how the sound worked and kind of extracted that into a sound generator. Um, and then uh, just after Kansas Fest last year, I finally cracked the code on how to get it to play as a two-player game instead of a one-player game. So um, you can have two people huddled over the keyboard and one uses the keys on the right half of the keyboard to uh, kick and punch, and the other uses the keys on the left hand of the keyboard. Uh, but first, uh, I couldn't do any of this without Virtual 2. If you don't use Virtual 2, um, I would suggest uh, giving it a shot, mainly because of the debugger. Um, the debugger in it is really cool and has all kinds of uh, ways to modify the code live as it's running, uh, give you all kinds of breakpoints, and do a... Um, uh, a really kind of deep dive into the way uh, a program is running uh, in emulation and you can step through it and you can speed it up and slow it down and all kind of stuff. Um, so this is going to be a love letter to Virtual 2 as much as it is a tour of Karateka. So um, as I was trying to sort out where to put in my code for having the enemy character punch or kick, I was looking for a subroutine that was basically JSR punch. If you were doing it, if you were designing it in such a way that there was a subroutine for punch and another one for kick and another one for walk or what have you, there would be a subroutine that it jumps to or that it branches to that uh, would do the punch and when it's done punching it would go back out. So in Virtual 2, and I'm going to walk a little bit in front of the projector here, so don't be scared. Um, in Virtual 2's uh, inspector and uh, in the debugger, you can go and look at what's on the stack. So in the stack, if you're familiar with it, it'll show you, uh, it holds the addresses of the last few things that have been um, jumped to or uh, uh, subroutines that it's, that it's been JSR to. So I was looking to see if one of these JSRs, while I'm stopped in the middle of a punch or in the middle of a kick if one of these was the kick routine or the punch routine. So I would stop the code, go back to this JSR, put it into the, um, uh, into the program counter and just basically loop on that same routine again. And if it happened to be one where it happened to be where the enemy would punch over and over again as I did that, as I did that loop, then I found my punch routine. But unfortunately, <coughs> uh, Jordan Mechner did not design it that way. Uh, so instead, I started looking at things that were changing constantly in the, uh, in the memory as each, basically each frame of animation was happening. So I couldn't find a subroutine that was just for punching but maybe there was something in zero page that would say, here is a punch coming up, or here is a kick coming up. So uh, again, with uh, Virtual 2, you can export chunks of memory, you freeze the state, export a chunk of memory, save it to a text file, and this is just a base, this is a hex editor, I think it's called uh, Hex Fiend or whatever on the Mac, but there's a zillion hex editors. This one happens to give you side-by-side -side diffs of this is, about to kick, and then this is kick frame one. So those are two frozen states of the, um, the virtual two machine that I uh, dumped the zero page out into a file um, and then dumped it out again during the kick. And you can see there are some things that are different and they're highlighted in red. So I would go through and find, okay, so this one goes from 5F to 3F. Wonder what happens if I set this back to 5F? on this frame and then run it again. Or keep it from changing. So going into Virtual 2 and 
changing it back after it changes to 3F, change it back to 5F, that kind of thing. So I found some, um, some interesting locations in zero page and started to modify them or keep them from being modified to see what happens if the code can't change address number, say, 21 um, to, a, uh, to a different character, a different, um, uh, a different value. So in Virtual 2's debugger, you have the ability to put in breakpoints. So anytime the code reaches a certain breakpoint, it will break and go back to the debugger. You can also add watch points so that if the value of, in this case, the address 21 in zero page changes, you get a break there. So code's running along, running along, and then it sees that something changes in memory at that location, it breaks, and you can see what, you know, where you are in the, in the program and why it changed. So, uh, enemy action, question mark. Does 21 tell me what, what the enemy's doing? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't. But I could see it changing. I could see why it was changing because in the, in the debugger again, um, I added breakpoints for when it changed and then looked for other places where it did change. Or where, not where it changed, but where it loaded. So, I looked for any instruction LDA21, which is A521 in hex, so find hex A521. So I found and added breakpoints any place where 21 was being read. And similarly, anywhere where it was being changed with an STA or an STX or an STY or an increment. Um, so finding places where it was loading or changing various zero page uh, locations kind of gave me a clue as to what was happening, but in order to really see what was happening, I needed to change them. So I found at 6488, it was doing a, a, a load 21 or a store 21. And so instead, I changed it with the memory editor, also virtual 2 debugger, has a memory editor, so you can change the uh, active state of the machine live while it's broken, fix it, and uh, make, your, uh, make your, your code run uh, from there. So uh, I changed it to EAEA, which is a no-op code. So instead of reading 21, it's not doing anything. It's just skipping over that part. And so I ended up with a couple of interesting locations that did various things. So this is, this is the, the enemy in the middle of a kick, but also in the middle of a punch, and he's frozen that way. So I found something that worked on which frame of animation it was doing, or um, you know, what, uh, what the action was. Ah, so it's getting closer. So it's like Hunt the Wumpus. Um, so when I, got to, when I got to a zero page location that did this, okay, so he's, he's not doing anything. He's just, uh, just taking the abuse. What a guy. Anyhow, so I, like I said, I was getting closer. Um, but I knew it was, I knew it was getting closer because it was the right action. It was kicking and punching wasn't happening. Um, but, uh, the, the enemy would still run up or this enemy was still there and had this, the right frames. Um, and then I found a particular location where it was always getting jumped to at 6540. And okay, 6540 is important because it keeps coming back there. It must be something that does every frame of animation or every time it has to make a decision, it's going to this, to this place. So I had a breakpoint there. And it looks like it's loading 2F. So I looked in 2F and I changed it. And it's not, not working right. It's not doing what I expect it to do. But look a little closer and when it's waiting, the accumulator is zero. When it's kicking, the accumulator is D7. When it's punching, it's C5. And when it's moving, it's one. And that was consistent. If I stopped it in the middle of a kick, it was D7. If I stopped it in the middle of a punch, it was C5. So I found some states that were changing based on, or some locations that were changing, in this case, the accumulator. Um, and it was going to the same memory location over and over again with different values for the different states that the enemy was in. So ha, now, I can drop it, flip it, and reverse it, and 
go back and see where the code is jumping to 6540. So I've got LDA D7, so that was my kick. And then it's jumping to 6540. Okay, so whatever's happening here at 6C1B is loading a kick. So I'm going to comment that out and see if he doesn't kick anymore. So here it is 6540, load X, D7's kicking. And then I found the one for punching, and I found the one for moving. And so when I patched those out to no ops, he comes up, he gets in his stance, he comes at you, because I hadn't gotten to the moving part yet, but he doesn't do anything. Doesn't respond, just keeps coming at you, but never punches or kicks. Aha! So now I've found the bits. Now I need to patch the bits. Yo. Um, so, little tiny patch here. Instead of um, loading from zero page, checking to see whether it's D7 and then jumping to 6540, I'm actually setting it to D7 when I'm pressing the M key. So I'm. This is the this is the hex for it, but it's uh, LDA C1000 is a uh, read to keyboard. Compare that to CD, which is capital M. Uh, if it's not it, then branch over it to here, which is just storing the strobe and clearing it. But if it is, we load the accumulator with D7 and then jump to our 6540, which is the routine that determines whether I'm kicking or punching. So that's the essential make Karateka into a two-player game chunk of code is this little bit here, and it just happens to go right there. And then there's another one a little bit after it, and then there's another one further down from moving. But the little tiny bites of, little tiny chunks of code that patch the binary after it's loaded into memory. So from there, now that I could do it live, I had to write a disk image and all that so that when you loaded it, it loaded this instead of the original code, which meant looking for <coughs> these, well, looking for the original bytes on the disk in the DSK, which I got from Antoine because he had a cracked version that was really easy to load and it loaded quicker, quicker than didn't have to go through the multiple loading stages and all that. So I looked for the original bytes in the DSK in the hex editor, replaced them with my bytes, and so when it loads into memory, 6C11 is my code instead of Jordan's code. So that's making it work from a disk image. And you can load and play that disk image now at archive.org in your browser. I know I've run through really quick because I don't have much time. How much time do I have left? About 10, 10, 12 minutes. Oh, awesome. I talked even faster than I was anticipating. Any questions? First, let me say I thought it was impressive because not only did you creatively like think of uh, the idea of having a two-player game, but then you technically went through and actually made it happen. And my question is, where exactly are you placing your patches? Is it in the places where Jordan Mechner had code to control the player automatically, and you found those, and then you just patched on top of those? Yes. Uh, the question was where am I where am I putting the patches? Um, the uh, there's a there's a few bytes before uh, what I showed you where it's um, reading from zero page and uh, reading from the values in zero page to determine whether it's kicking and then setting it and then jumping to that location and that chunk there is what I'm patching over there is still a mechanism that actually sets those zero page addresses. So it's still doing the AI for, I want to do a kick next, I want to do a punch next, but I'm ignoring it. So um, that part is still running. I haven't patched that. So the AI can still tell it to, to kick and punch in whatever pattern, but I'm never reading that value from zero page, I'm reading it from the keyboard instead. It, it actually requires a couple of more bytes, but 
I've, I've patched into areas where it's not doing anything important. <laughs> uh, it's, doing, it's doing stuff like, have I already kicked? I'm going to kick twice, or I need to move, or I need to get closer to the player, or whatever. Um, and so it's just a couple of bytes before that to see if it's close enough to do an attack, or if the distance between the player and, uh, the, player and the enemy is too much, it automatically moves forward, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so yeah, I'm taking a little bit more space than the original code does, but I'm not, I'm not clobbering anything that's important. So uh, there might be a tighter way to do it. Um, it'd be great if I could you know, just get it down into like everything is even smaller than the original and I have some no-ops on either side, but that is, that is beyond my, uh, my abilities. Anybody? Yeah? Each time, each time the each time player one wins, he has to run to the next guy, and then player two takes over the next guy. So you get all the way through the game, the eagle is still not patched. So you still have to player one still has to beat the eagle. Um, but you could get all the way down to Akuma, and your friend who's playing as the enemies can play Akuma, and you know player one has to beat him. Um, uh, I, I haven't got a, uh, a patched version where it patches out the eagle yet, because I'd really like that. I'm just going to skip that level. Um, uh, but yeah, basically, player one stays the same and does all the same things that the original player does. Player two just controls the enemies as you come up on them. Just a comment. Hey, I think that's awesome. And congratulations. And B, I want to second what you said about you. Yeah, a second uh, nomination for Virtual 2 for game hacking. If you, uh, if you have a Mac and you're you know, working on, um, working on uh, a game of your own or patching or hacking something else, it's, uh, it's an awesome set of tools packaged together. Sarah? Uh, does that require the uh, You could do it with the free version. You just have like 10 minutes at a time or something like that of play time. Yeah, all the tools, uh, all the tools in, in Virtual 2 are part of the free version, as far as I know, except for basically the time limit. Yeah. Third on the Virtual 2 for game hacking and also any kind of debugging, and I had a question, which is since uh, you kind of got deep into the code, mm -hmm. is there any statistical uh, difference in the power of the enemy combatants, the guards, and the Puma versus the player? Like, do they have the same? Uh, no damage difference. The, the difference is, uh, in, as in the original game, a, as you progress, the player gets fewer hit points and the enemy gets more hit points. Okay. Um, that part could be another patch so that they're always equal or you always have more or you, know, the, you do more damage or they don't do any damage or what have you. Um, a similar process where you'd find where sure. the, the points are taken. Um, and I think there's already, there may already be patched versions of uh, Karateka where you're immortal. You know, you basically, you have infinite hit points <laughs> or they never, they never do damage. Um, that's, you know, easy mode um, gameplay. Uh, but no, I haven't done any, I haven't patched anything as far as, you know, power levels or anything like that. So as, you, as player one progresses, player two gets harder and harder to beat. Just, in, just as in the original game. Yeah. So, you know, you get your, you get your little brother he plays player two, and you beat him a couple of times, and then he gets frustrated, and then he starts beating you. And, you know, you balance, balance the power. Do <laughs> I have time for one more question? Or? Yeah. All right. Eight minutes. Oh, uh, okay. I was, I was expecting this to... Uh, okay, I, I blasted through this. So, any other questions? Uh, anything that would have made it easier to get to the patching part. Um, understanding the design of the, the game better. Um, approaching it as, you know, uh, well, the knowing, knowing what Jordan did in his head and how it 
how it worked as opposed to how I would have designed it as a novice. Um, so I wasn't trying to come at it backwards thinking, oh, he designed it this way and everything is a subroutine of a subroutine of a subroutine. It's a controller that is doing things on each frame and then checking what to do before it does it as opposed to doing a subroutine, coming back to it and what did I do. That's kind of, that's how I, that's how I build the little uh, low res things that I build. And so they're looping within loops and loops and loops. Um, and the game is totally different that way. So if I knew how it was designed better to begin with, I would have done this in you know fewer steps. So if you, knowing what you know on how you did this now, if you mm -hmm. said, okay, I'm gonna take Choplifter and let one player control the paint to paint, mm -hmm. uh, uh, would, now that you've done this, do you think it would be easier to locate that now that you know the steps you took for Karateka? Yes. Yes. Uh, the question was, could I apply the same kind of thing to perhaps patching Choplifter so that it's a two-player game for you know, one place and controlling the tank in Choplifter? Uh, and yeah, I probably would have a better time of doing it than I started out with uh, just because I know the debugger better and I know, the, you know how things work in the stack and, and things like that because I was still learning uh, a lot of the assembly um, uh, concepts as I was doing this and it came up with um, different ways to uh, to go through the code just by looking at the code and understanding where it was going uh, and so I learned a lot and it was part of the the goal of anything that I do is uh, is a learning exercise that and you know the inspiration was me and my brother we always wanted to play against each other uh, <laughs> we would take turns you know if I beat enemy number one then he'd run and do enemy number two and we'd take turns and then um, you know, if one of us got killed, we'd start over and take turns, you know. Uh, but we always wanted to fight against each other. Ken? Have you played this with your brother? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> he, lives, he lives three states away, so we'd have to get, uh, we'd have to get together with uh, a computer and an emulator. But usually when we get... Yeah. Yeah. I leave that as an exercise for a better programmer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe if somebody, if, if somebody were to put together a networked emulator that could take two inputs, an emulator that oh, had a... Real hardware, real hardware. Oh, real hardware, okay. Uh, well, usually when my brother and I get together, it's to get our kids together at the beach, and I don't tend to bring uh, Apple IIs to the beach. Um, I don't want to get them yellowed any more than they already are. That's a problem. This is, uh, thank you, Javier. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the portable ones, yeah. the portable ones, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a flat screen. Uh, anything else before I cede my time? All right, thank you. And find a friend, and uh, you can read about the you can read about the patch details and how to play two-player uh, on archive.org, and the um, the the steps are uh, pretty easy to follow for whatever kind of game you want to uh, make your own. And uh, I'm looking forward to see what other people come up with for future versions of Karateka and future versions of Choplifter or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Charles.